Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Anton Pozniak, President elect of the International AIDS Society, and Hale Gettahun, TB, HIV, and Community Engagement Coordinator at the WHO, to announce this year's IAS TB HIV Research Prize winners. Good morning. Tuberculosis remains one of the leading causes of deaths of people living with HIV. HIV causes 19-fold times high risk of active TB, and TB accelerates the decline of immune function among people living with HIV. In 2015, there were 1.8 million people living, dying of TB, out of which 400,000 were uh, people living with HIV. Between 2005 and 2015, impl implementation of the WHO collaborative TB HIV activities saved an estimated 6.5 million lives, but much more needs to be done to achieve universal access to these life-saving measures and to eliminate HIV-associated TB. Good morning. It's with great, it's with great pleasure that I am going to present with uh, uh, Dr. Hailey the two 1,000 US dollar IAS TBHIV research prizes. These are incentives for young and established researchers to investigate pertinent research questions that affect TBHIV co-infection and operational effectiveness of implementing core TBHIV collaborative services. The prizes are presented to the two top scoring abstracts in any of these areas. The 2017 TB HIV Research Prizes are awarded to Sekai Chennai Matabiri of Zimbabwe for her abstract entitled Feasibility of Using Determined TB Lamb Test in HIV Infected Adults in Programmatic Conditions, and Boris Chakunti Yungai of France for his abstract entitled Incidence of Tuberculosis in the First Year of Antiviral Treatment in West African HIV Infected Adults. Please join us in congratulating their contributions to TBHIV research. To introduce our first plenary speaker, please welcome Madame la Présidente Valérie Précresse, a graduate from both HEC and ENA. Valérie Précresse was first a judge at the Conseil d'État, the highest administrative jurisdiction. She was appointed to the French presidency in 1998 by Jacques Chirac as advisor for new technologies and the internet. She was elected member of the National Assembly from June 2002 to January 2016. She was appointed Minister for Higher Education and Research by President Nicolas Sarkozy in May 2007. In 2011, she became Minister of Budget and Government Spokesperson from Ju June 2012 to December 2015, she acted as Member of Parliament, Member of the Finance Commission. In December 2015, she was elected to Paris Region's Presidency. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am honoured to be here today as the President of Paris Region. I am delighted to welcome you in France and especially in Paris. The IAS plenary session is a great and rare opportunity for science, leadership, and stakeholders to meet and make decisive progress in preventing and curing HIV. 
IAS is a milestone meeting for the global response to HIV. And you are the most powerful weapon against the disease. Here in the Paris region, we concentrate 42% of people who discovered their seropositivity and near a third of people living with the HIV in France. This is one of the reasons why your cause is one of our regional priority. This is why I've been defending this cause for the past 20 years, and we have set for our region a goal to eradicate HIV. I am counting on measures for disease prevention, measures against discriminations, and last but not least, research. Note that all fields taken together, region's budget for scientific research was increased by more than 20% this year. Yesterday evening, I had the opportunity to discuss with researchers, industrialists, and associations, because we need to all work together if we hope to overcome HIV. The ninth IAS session is an opportunity to show how much progress has been made, but also how much still lies ahead. Now, let me introduce Mr. Tazuku Honjo, Professor of Immunology and Genomic Medicine at Kyoto University and President of the Foundation for Biomedical Research and Innovation in Japan. Dear Mr. Honjo, you graduated from the Faculty of Medicine at Kyoto University in 1966 after obtaining your PhD in biochemistry. You spent four years in the United States as a postdoctoral fellow, first at the Carnegie Institution in Washington and then at the National Institute of Health, where you initiated studies on immunoglobulin genes. Thanks to you and your research, two major groundbreaking discoveries have been made in the field of immunotherapy. The role of programmed cell death protein in the immune response, the activation-induced citidine deaminase enzyme that is essential for class switch recombination. You have received numerous awards and honors for your pioneering work, including the Order of Culture from the Emperor of Japan, the Robert Koch Prize, and the Imperial Prize in the Japan Academy. You're also an honor honorary member of the American Association of Immunologists, a foreign associate of the National Academy of Science, a member of Leopoldina, the German Academy of Natural Scientists, and a member of the Japan Academy. Mr. Honjo, you have the floor. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for a very nice introduction. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation for inviting me to this uh, uh, International Congress of HIV, which I never attended. This is my first appearance in this uh, meeting. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce you today how we encountered PD-1 and how we approached this molecule for the treatment of cancer. And hopefully, I'd like to convince you this protein might be also useful for treatment of HIV. Uh, so, uh, the first time we encountered PD-1 is very accidental. A student, Ishida, was looking for the protein which is required for program cell death in thymus. He did a subtraction between thymocyte, which can be stimulated to die, or a hematopoietic progenitor when he uh, removed IL-3 also goes to die. In both cases, he found a very unique protein, namely unknown protein PD-1, which has a membrane domain and extracellular and intracellular. 
and particularly in Drosera region has two highly conserved tyrosine, which tell the protein might be signaling protein. The question is, what kind of signal? We knocked out this protein and found, in all cases, on different genetic background of the mice, C57 black, Bob C, other NOD, MRL, all show different phenotype of autoimmune diseases. For example, black mice showed nephritis, arthritis, white mice showed dilated cardiomyopathy. myopathy, all clearly indicating that protein is responsible for suppression of immune system to avoid autoimmune diseases. So this must be a break of immune regulation. Subsequently, Taku Okazaki found this protein intracellular domain is phosphorylated and recruits SHUP2 phosphatase that removes the phosphate activated by antigen recognition. This way, the protein can serve as a negative regulator of immune response. As you know, all system, including immune system, requires break and axel. And especially immune system, they have two sets of break and axel. When it stays, like car is parked, you need uh, accelerator is CD28 and a special brake for parking brake CTL4. While they are driving on the highway, they need I course as accelerator and a PD1 as a brake. These two type of immunoregulatory molecule subsequently identified having a different type of ligand. For example, CD28, CDL4 share the same ligand, therefore it's all or none type regulation. On the other hand, PD1 and ICOS has independent ligand. PD1 has two ligand, PDL1 and L2, and therefore these axle and brake work independently and control the speed of the car more a real static way, not all or none. Now, as you know, the balance of these brake and uh, accelerator is essential for regulation of severance or immune tolerance. When you have hyperimmunity, you have to have some a reagent to reduce the activity to treatment autoimmunity. But at the same time, this causes a risk of higher uh, risk of infectious disease and cancer. The other way around, when the immune tolerance is reduced, you have to give the axel or break blockade, in this case, PD-1 blockade, and treat infectious disease and cancer. But the same side of the coin always risk of autoimmunity. The idea to use immune system for treatment of cancer has been a long time, and all fail. This includes cancer vaccination, activation immune cells in vitro, putting back to the patient, or giving cytokines like interferon gamma. All failed, couldn't give the convincing scientific evidence. So we started to think the PD-1 and also CTL4 might be a good candidate to treat cancer because especially PD-1 has a very low side effect, as you can see, only after six months the mice showed some phenotype. So it's a mild phenotype, and then we started a new trial. Yoshiko Yoai and Nagahiro Minato started test this, comparing CJ, this is a myeloma cell, and the myeloma cell which express PD-1 ligand and introduced in bulb C mice with PD-1 or without PD-1. You can clearly see the growth of tumor completely suppressed in the absence of PD-1, namely without a break, with strong immune system the tumor growth is completely suppressed. The same thing happens when we treat the animal with antibody blocking PD-1 and its ligand interaction. Survival is also prolonged. So we decided to create 
human antibody and fortunately Medalex who had the patent and technology to make a human immunoglobulin in transgenic mice it's called xenomice and agreed to collaborate and they made antibody which has a very strong affinity and the reduced ADCC function and this was quickly approved by FDA as a investigation new drug and clinical trial started in the United States and Japan. In all cases, you have to remember, nobody believed in cancer immunotherapy. So the patient recruited almost to die. The very last terminal phase of the patient were recruited and the cancer type were various lung cancer, colon cancer, melanoma, renal cancer, and prostate cancer. And the rumors circulate the trial is giving good response. And clinical data was summarized in 2012 to Parian and Johns Hopkins group published data and showing on 296 patients with terminal stage cancers, complete remission or partial remission was observed especially melanoma patient, almost 30% of patients showed complete or partial response and other lung cancer and renal cancer as well. And of course, there are some side effects which is related with this treatment, but this can be prevented if the clinician watched very carefully. The most striking observation from this study came from this chart. This is the size of tumor going, growing and reducing. And that this is the clinical phase one trial. The treatment was stopped after six months. And patient was observed later. And the strikingly, 20 of 31 responders lasted the state more than a year and a half, indicating this shot six months treatment enough to maintain the state over years. This durable response is very unusual, unprecedented for any type of cancer treatment so far. We also did some clinical trial in ovarian cancer and one lady uh, showed a very strong uh, tumors in the peritoneal cavity, but fortunately, uh, the treatment after four months completely removed and the lady still survive. Most striking clinical data was randomized study of untreated melanoma patient with nivofam and dacarbazine as a typical alkylating agent came and published 2014. Here you can clearly see nivofam treated patient survive over 70% after a year and a half, and the other control less than 20%, and this clinical trial was ethically uh, stopped by ethical committee. So why immunotherapy but not chemotherapy have durable effects? This is because chemicals treat tumors, but not completely. If you give that high dose, that can affect normal cells. The chemical has to be given just kill the tumor cells, not 100%, but some surviving tumor can recover and form resistant cells. And this will be repeated and never ends. But in the case of immunotherapy, lymphocyte can recognize all mutants and attack them. And this has been already shown by a number of studies, for example, published in 2015. Each tumor has a variable level of mutations. This uh, axis shows coding mutation. So normally it's zero. So all tumors has either 10,000 times or even and the times rate of the mutation frequency on the surface of the each cancer cell. That can be recognized by tumor uh, immune cells as enemy and can be detected. 
the most convincing evidence came from Johns Hopkins group putting the colon cancer into two cohorts, those which has mismatch repair deficiency and those which has proficiency. And clearly, patient which has mismatch repair deficiency means more mutation is very sensitive to PD-1 treatment. Those which has repair system, less mutation survive, uh, less sensitive to the PD-1 treatment. So, PD-1 treatment shows a very adverse, less adverse effect because no direct damage on normal cell, less uh, sorry, effective for a wide range of tumors, more than 200 clinical trials going on, and also, most importantly, long-term effects to responders after six months treatment. And so far, melanoma, lung cancer, renal cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, head and neck cancer, and orothelial cancer have been approved and widely used all over the world. Now, this is the major question to most of the audience. Is PD-1 blockade therapy applicable to infectious diseases? The answer is yes. We published the paper 2003. Here, Yoshiko Iwai made a lung Z labeled adenovirus in injected, and in wild type, day seven, still lots of adenovirus, day 13, almost cleared. But in PD-1 deficient animals, day 17 almost cleared, and day 30, none. So it clearly tells the PD-1 blockade boosts the antivirus activity. And sure enough, several groups already tested this in animal model. The most famous one was in macaque study uh, carried out Emory's group. In this study, they showed they have a long statement, but significant reductions in plasma viral load and also prolonged the survival of HIV, SIV-infected macaques. The blockade was effective during the early week 10 as well as late week 90. Phases chronic infection even after conditions of severe lymphopenia. I show you one data. Here, uh, this is the fold of reduction. So this is a reduction higher. And you can see PD-1 treated macaque early phase and late phase. The viral load was striking reduced as compared to control antibody treatment. And also macaque survival uh, frequency is much reduced compared to control treatment. And more recently, mouse model was also engineered and showed PD-1 blockade in the chronically HIV-infected humanized mice suppresses virus loads. Here again, PD-1 blockade resulted in a very significant 45-fold reduction in HIV viral loads in humanized mice with high CD4 T cell expression of PD-1. So I also show you one data from this study. So this is a bit complicated system. They start from the NOZ mice and transferred fetal thymus, fetal liver, and called uh, bone marrow, liver, and thymus humanized mice. And they inject HIV and then uh, serial blood analysis to monitor the type of the virus, and then start injection of anti-PD-1 day 13 uh, around a week or two, and then follow the blood sample. And the outcome is summarized here. You can see plasma viral loads and goes up, and then after treatment of the anti-PD-1 antibody drops dramatically within, this is a weeks, within a few weeks. So 
This is very striking for the PD-1 high mice, but not so PD-1 low mice. But anyway, in all these cases, PD-1 treatment shows a very promising data. But as far as I know, I have never seen a single case of the clinical trial of PD-1 treatment for HIV patient. Why this? I believe PD-1 treatment have advantage over the chemical treatment. The first, it's just short term. One treatment or few treatment may rescue the patient for life time, long. It's just one time. But in the opposite, chemical treatment, you have to treat patient every week or every month for, for life, lifetime. Secondary, it's almost complete a cure. They reconstruct immune system to the normal level. But in a chemical treatment, and disease there, they just control disease under a certain threshold. Thirdly, antibody cost may be even lower than lifelong drug cost. I have to calculate more precisely how much it costs. Suppose patient live 40 years and the antibody treatment is just one crew for five times shot. Uh, this has to be more seriously considered. Now, the PD-1 treatment is certainly very promising, but not complete. There are many problems. The most important problem is what is a predictable biomarker for responders? This we recently identified. In PD-1 mice, somehow mitochondrial activities were upregulated. We suspected mitochondrial function, which can be measured by oxygen consumption using several inhibitors, can be monitored. And what we have done is compare antibody sensitive tumor inoculated mice and those who are insensitive. And you can clearly see antibody sensitive tumor case, the mitochondrial function of T cell is stimulated, but non-sensitive tumor case, T cell itself do not respond. So this is a very good marker for responder and non-responder. So to make the long story short, what happens is T cell receptor stimulation, the major first target is mitochondrial activation. This raises mitochondrial loss, cellular loss, and uh, sends to the message to many energy sensors, MPK, mTOR, and that leads to the many subsequent markers, especially PZC1, alpha transcription factor that regulate series of enzymes to reach to the mitochondrial expansion and activation. And I don't have time going into detail, but this part of the story is a good marker. And also, I'm telling you, uh, this is very important, sustained proliferation of T cell instead of inducing apoptosis of the T cell. Another important point is, is there any possibility to cure non-responders by combinatorial therapy? Yes, we have done this. The ROS mitochondrial activator is important. So why don't we give the Rupelox, which is the ROS inducing agent, and this is a tumor volume and the days after inoculation. And you can see anti-PD-1 plus Rupelox, which causes ROS, completely block the tumor growth and prolong the survival. But Rupelox alone without PD-1 has no effect. So this combinatorial activity is very important. And as you know, the T cell uh, population are stimulated by antigen activated and some cells terminal difference and die, but some cell remain memory cell and continue to work. So the balance of mTOR and MPK is very critical to maintain the balance of T cell differentiation. 
we therefore tested AMK activator, mTO activator, and both have certain significant effect on the tumor volume, but most important is combination of two. And these two combinations affect the survival and also growth blocking. The molecular mechanism I started was and MK M2 activation, and what leads to the mitochondrial activation. And what we found is, in fact, it's a PDC1 alpha, which has been claimed to be a very important transcription activator. And this protein interact with PEPR and ear are alpha, and eventually leads to the mitochondrial activation and genesis. Therefore, we introduced low molecular chemicals that affect this pathway. Bezafibrate, and you can clearly see bezafibrate alone has no effect on the tumor growth, but a combination of bezafibrate and anti-PD-1 further blocks this uh, PD-1 treatment. Also true for the uh, ultipats, which is upstream of PDC1 alpha. So the conclusion is mitochondrial activation may be a good marker for immunotherapy effectiveness. PD1 blockade combinatorial therapy using mitochondrial activators, especially PDC1 alpha activators, may be promising, and a clinical trial should be carried out, and actually we are doing now. This combination therapy may save more patients and cost, and may be also useful for HIV patients. Last year, Andy Cogan uh, published an article in New Scientist saying, we are at the point where we have discovered the cancer equivalent of penicillin. So this means penicillin itself couldn't cure all infectious diseases. It gave rise to a whole generation of antibiotics that changed medicine forever. Concerning almost previously fatal infectious infections to history. So future prospect, I believe PD-1 is still a minor fraction of the cancer treatment, but in future it will grow and eventually the most of the cancer can be treated as a first line by immunotherapy, and in most of the cases, cancer could be considered of the chronic diseases like HIV people consider now. I'd like to stress the acquired immunity evolved in vertebrates as a different system against the pathogens. Consequently, the lifespan of vertebrates expanded dramatically. Cancer cells accumulate the mutation and express narrow antigens, which can be fortunately recognized by acquiring immunity. This is a very fortunate outcome of our acquired immunity. So, 20th century eradication of many infectious diseases by vaccination antibiotics, hopefully in 21st century chronic viral infections and cancer may be controlled by PD-1 blockade therapy and its improvement. I'd like to introduce my colleagues, uh, Kenji Chamato, who pushed this combinatorial therapy together with Pater Shadru and Alok Kumar. I'd also thank many um, funding agency supporting my research for a long time. Thank you for your attention. To introduce our second speaker, please welcome Marika Weinrocks, Interim Executive Director of the Global Fund. Marika Weinrocks joined the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria as its Chief of Staff in 2013, 
and was recently appointed as its interim executive director. Before joining the Global Fund, Marika Weinrocks was ambassador for HIV and AIDS and deputy director of the Social Development Department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Professor Anjo. It was a fascinating and thought-provoking presentation and it illustrates how important it is to bring different disciplines together so that we can learn from the, the findings in, in other fields of, of research. Really fascinating. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker of Wednesday's plenary session, Professor Alexandra Kalmi from my village, Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Kalmi is an associate professor and head of the HIV and AIDS unit at the Geneva University Hospital. Her research interest is in the public health and humanitarian responses to HIV and AIDS, specifically the provision of antiretroviral therapy and the management of side effects in resource-limited settings. Professor Kalmi worked as a medical doctor with Médecins Sans Frontières in Cambodia in 1996 and has supported MSF's HIV and AIDS work for over 10 years. She is a member of the WHO working groups on the writing and implementation of guidelines related to treatment of HIV in developing countries since 2001. Professor Kalmi is the head of the CSS 6 committee at the ANR ANRS, the French National Agency for Research on AIDS and Viral Hepatitis. She is a member of the scientific board of the Swiss HIV study uh, cohort and the Federal Commission for Sexual Health in Switzerland. Alexandra Kalmi is also a reviewer for numerous well-recognized medical journals and has published herself over 100 articles in peer-reviewed medical journals. She is a medical doctor trained in internal medicine and infectious diseases from the University of Geneva. Professor Kalmi also holds, holds a PhD in clinical research on HIV and AIDS from the University of New South Wales. And Alexandra Kalmi is going to talk about antiretroviral therapy and beyond. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this kind introduction and thank you to the organizers for their invitation. It is truly an honor to be here in Paris today. This slide shows my disclosures. And here is a summary of the topics that I shall cover today, from the bright side of therapy to its limitations, including prescription practices, therapeutic trials, treatment simplification, the drug pipelines, and access issues. Let's start with the bright side of therapy. Today, 19.5 million individuals worldwide receive anti-HIV drugs. Antiretroviral drug coverage is around 50% with considerable gender and regional differences. ART coverage for men living in Central Africa is as low as 20% and below 30% for both men and women living in Eastern Europe. This year, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the, ver the very first anti-HIV drug on the market, Zydovidin, quite a milestone. During the past three decades, the knowledge of HIV molecular biology has allowed the development of more than 30 drugs targeting distinct mechanisms. At present, ART are categorized into six different classes. In 2017, the once daily formulation of Reltegravir and the generic version of Truvada have both been cleared by the FDA. New fixed dose combination, including the Runevir and Bictegravir, are currently submitted. The efficacy and the access to antiretroviral drugs translated into a dramatic impact of HIV response on life expectancy, even in countries strongly affected by the AIDS epidemic. And indeed, we have experienced major changes in prescription practices over the last three to five years. 
The higher efficacy and safety of treatment enable ambitious goals to be reached as to achieve containment of the HIV epidemic. Newer regimen options already make 90% viral suppression possible, however, in naive patients only. And this week, WHO recommend to rapidly start ART within days of HIV diagnosis. In Switzerland, more than 240 initial different regimens were prescribed during the last 10 years. As a consequence of better treatment options, the number of initial regimens dramatically dropped to only 15 in the last two years. And today, 90% of treatment initiation is done with only six regimens. In countries who can afford it, there is a choice of six once daily fixed dose combinations. Today, and following the WHO recommendations, the most popular triple fixed dose regimen worldwide does still contain efavirenz. We expect soon the regulatory approval of the Dolutegravir Treaty C and TDF triple combination manufactured by at least two, two generic suppliers. Sometimes, practice is ahead of formal recommendation. As an example, Integrase inhibitor, shown in red on this graph, accounts now for nearly 80% of all treatment initiation regimens in Switzerland, and this barely three years after they have entered the Swiss market. So, have the Swiss found the magic bullet? <laughs> There are a number of considerations when choosing a treatment regimen, notably patient-specific and regimen-specific. This may include comorbidities, previous ART exposure, but also regimen cost or the barrier to resistance. With this specification in mind, how are we going to reconcile mass treatment and treatment individualization? That is the challenging role for guideline experts and for clinicians. Here we compare preferred in green and alternative in yellow first-line options among a choice of recommendations from the US, Europe, France and WHO. All guidelines except WHO recommend to begin treatment using a drug from the integrase inhibitor class. WHO is the only guideline recommending one single preferred combined pill, allowing the harmonization of treatment in various contexts, at least for countries with a low level of baseline transmitted resistance. However, since 2016, WHO recognizes the possibility of alternative combinations, dolutegravir, namely DTG, a drug from the integrase inhibitor class, and a favorance dose at 400 milligrams. Are we ready for the universal adoption of the WHO alternative options? While it is unlikely that a favorant 400 milligrams becomes a worldwide treatment standard, the answer is probably yes for DTG. There are challenges that currently prevent its use in some specific but frequent situations. Rifampicin co-administration, pregnancy, and younger age. However, as shown in this slide, experience with this drug in low- and middle-income countries is rapidly growing, with studies specifically designed to target these populations. Major clinical trials are underway and should provide an answer on the general application and the positioning of newer drugs. The NAMZAL trial primarily intends to demonstrate that DTG is non-inferior or superior to efavirenz 400 mg in naive patients. The advanced study will assess DTG and TAF compared with the WHO standard in 1,050 patients initiating treatment in South Africa. Two RCTs, one in adult, the Downing study and one in children, the Odyssey study, have chosen to test the use of DTG in second-line therapy. 
The Downing study presented yesterday at this conference was prematurely stopped as the DTG arm performed better when compared to the WHO recommended boosted lopinavir. Thus today, it is uncertain whether the most cost-effective role for DTG is to replace efavirenz as a first-line regimen, to replace boosted PI in second-line regimens, or to replace both with a single regimen approach. We talked before about the Bictagravir, QD, Raltegravir, and TAF being FDA submitted. How will these new therapies position themselves in the near future? Tenofovir olefenamide, or TAF, is a prodrug of tenofovir and achieves high intracellular concentrations of tenofovir diphosphate in PBMCs. Is TAF a candidate for inclusion in a universal regimen? Yes, but with some remaining uncertainties. FDA validations were based on switch studies. Data on a TAF standalone formulations for HIV are not available and tough data for using children, co-administration with rifampicin, PrEP, or during pregnancy are still pending. However, tenofovir prodrug will dramatically reduce cost due to the need of lower amount of active pharmaceutical ingredients. And the anticipate, anticipated regulatory approval for generic suppliers is expected late 2019. Important results reporting new triple combinations for treatment initiation have been reported during the past two days. Bictegravir is a novel specific inhibitor of HIV in HIV-1 integrase tran transfer activity and structurally related to DTG. Results at one year suggest that these combinations are non-inferior to standard DTG regardless of the NRTI backbone. Doravirin, a next-generation NRTI, was proven non-inferior to efavirenz at 48 weeks. Finally, QD Roltegravir matches the results of the twice-daily dosage of this drug. Of note, women represent less than 20% of participants in all these trials. We are not yet ready to use these molecules as part as a universal regimen. Let's now have a look beyond therapeutic trial. By design, therapeutic trials do not allow for population generalization and are limited in their duration. They are performed in selected population and extreme age group, if I may say, such as adolescent or elderly, and patients with comorbidities are generally excluded from eligibility criteria. Thus, the importance of large community observational cohorts need here to be emphasized. Gender considerations for HIV research need also to be addressed. Pregnancy, reservoir size, response to treatment, hormonal adaptation, drug-drug interactions, contraception are all key issues and despite this, and as already mentioned, women represent less than 20% of participants in ARV studies. If RCTs are, are considered to be gold standard when assessing a new drug, symptomatic adverse events occurring in trials may differ when the drug is offered is a non-selected population. The number of patients discontinuating DTG in pivotal trials was negligible. Interestingly, in cohort studies, the estimated rates of neuropsychiatric adverse events leading to DTG discontinuation reached 7% at two years. In real life, some individuals are very creative to use drug side effects to their own advantage. Anecdotal reports have surfaced concerning misuse of the HIV antiretroviral medication. Efavirenz is crushed, mixed with other ingredients, and inhaled for its psychoactive effect. Combivir can be used for breast enlargement, and ritonavir is well known to prolong the effect 
of ecstasy or Viagra. Adverse events are reported to the sponsor by investigators, but the voice of patients reporting drug safety is often missing. This study conducted in oncology has shown that the monitoring of patient-related reported outcome translated into an improved quality of life and also an improved uh, survival. In the field of HIV, the study shows a summary of reported toxicity by single users on Twitter from 2010 to 2013. Twitter was able to capture the sentiment distribution for tweets referring to regimens containing effavorants, bad feeling, here in red, or repivirin, generally a good feeling, here in blue. Adding the patient's reported outcomes, such as quality of life, as a new indicator for treatment success should be standard for the coming decade of research. Are we able to make treatment lighter and simpler to improve patients' adherence and quality of life? Novel approaches are under investigation to simplify regimens. Dose reduction and formulation optimization may be using nanotechnology, drug de-escalations or short cycle therapy are promising strategies in the short term. And I warmly recommend you to attend the next session starting at 11 a.m which will present the state of the art of these strategies. I will now talk about three of these strategies. Effavorance and zydovidin can be prescribed with lower doses without compromising vir virological efficacy. Interesting data are emerging to reduce the dose of boosted darinavir from 800 down to 400 milligrams. A pilot trial is presented here in Paris by Jean-Michel Molina, and a phase three trial is ongoing in South Africa. Pediatric ARV is the major concern of drug optimization, and it is a serious challenge to provide simple regimen in this age group. We now have pellets of boosted lopinavir from the Indian manufacturer Cipla. Efforts are also being made to develop FDC to deliver first-line regimens to children, although none are currently accessible. Priority products have been identified and DTG 5 mg dispersible tablets are being tested. The oral therapies are a key strategy to optimize regimens. I will restrict my talk to trial testing an integrase inhibitor plus 3TC, here in orange, and those testing an integrase inhibitor plus an NNRTI in blue. Results of dual therapy maintenance trials have been presented in this conference. The SORT trial tested the combination of DTG and Rilpivirin, and favorable effects have been observed on both markers. The 96 weeks results of later two trials may position cabotegravir and rilpivirin long-acting injectables in the near future. In addition, a combination of haltegravir and etravirin showed a robust antiviral activity in aging patients that is above 45 years old. Thank you, the investigators. Non-randomized pilot trials testing DTG and 3TC also showed promising results, but larger randomized trials are expected within the next two years. Yet, simplified regimens are not universal. Long-term efficacy and toxicity remain a concern, especially in patients previously exposed to ART. So yes, we do need new drugs and we do need new formulations. There are at least two constraints for drug developers. Guidelines help to choose among the best few combinations, and combinations are more efficient in preventing viral rebound. As a result, many of the large manufacturers have withdrawn from HIV research, thus allowing the concentration of new conventional ART in a only handful of manufacturers. This slide shows the HIV pipeline in clinical evaluation 
with the aim of viral suppression. Long-acting drugs, regardless of their administration route, represent more than 50% of this pipeline and they will be evaluated for both treatment and prevention. They are still first-in-class compound, marked here with a star, that warrant our attention regarding their activity against multi-resistant viruses. Antibodies targeting the HIV receptor and core receptor, such as Ibalizumab or Pro-140, add the potential for dual antibody approaches. I will present one drug in phase one and one drug in phase three to illustrate the potential for further changes in prescription practices. The MK8591 is a potent nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor with a half-life of 150 hours in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. A once-weekly oral dose of 10 mg was proven more effective than a daily dose of the standard NRTI backbone TDF or TAF. There is an interesting potential for a long-acting formulation maybe using implants. Fostansavir is an attachment inhibitor acting at the entry point of the virus in the cell. This first in-class compound has now reached phase three and may provide the additional tool needed by ART multi-experienced patients. To end, and in the context of ART free remissions waiting for the PD-1, I would like to highlight the interesting role of highly potent, broadly neutralizing antibodies in this pipeline. Crowell et al. have shown yesterday that administering broadly neutralizing antibodies to virally suppressed, early treated volunteers was associated with a slightly delayed rebound of HIV viral load after the interruption of ART. Although the results were not clinically significant, why is it worth exploring this field further? First, it provides the basis for future studies with combination BNABs, more potent. And second, they have the potential as immunotherapy similar to the rationale of cancer immunotherapy. The paradigm is therefore changing. Formulations with small appeal less frequent dosing, long-acting compounds, and stronger resistant profiles are underway, with the potential of being cheaper and more accessible. Compounds from new classes are all expected to work for people with multiple drug-resistant HIV. And finally, biological remain a challenge, and combinations are made possible or will be made possible by a rich pipeline. This now brings me to a key issue, access to antiretroviral treatment, and this is not an option. The WHO Treat All recommendation is now implemented in 122 countries. In the absence of vaccine, antiretrovirals remain the cornerstone of HIV management at individual and public health level, as treatment is prevention, and we know this since nearly 10 years now with the Swiss statement issued in 2008. Access to drugs mean access to care. Two treatment cascades are shown here. On the left, the cascade of 11 European countries, including France, a country known for a free and universal access to care, approaching the UNH's 1990-90 targets well ahead 2020. On the right, the cascade of adolescents living in South Africa. Only 10% of this age group is reported with viral suppression. Drug availability is a determining factor for access, and the delay between drug approval for adults and for children reached nearly 11 years for atazanavir and nine years for tenofovir, and this delay is just not acceptable. Yet, can we assume that once new drugs are approved for children, we could use them, uh, for adults, we could use them for children without delay until proven otherwise? In the next three years, nearly 4.2 billion US dollars of ARV requirements may remain unfunded. Drug costs will probably continue to decrease and thus the aim, we aim 
to add another 90 to the unit's target. $90 per year per patient should be an achievable target within a year to treat HIV with newer drugs, to treat hepatitis B, and to treat hepatitis C. With the transition from efavirenz to DTG in large countries such as Brazil and Kenya, mechanisms to improve access to generic drugs is indispensable. The medicine patent pool has negotiated licenses that will allow to expand the geographical scope of innovative fixed-dose combinations such as TDF, 3TC and DTG, shown here, or even Bictegravir, as currently in negotiations. But antiretrovirals, even in the best situation, and even at low cost, cannot do everything. First, ARVs do not cure HIV. Early ARV prescription limits the reservoir size. Strategies to reduce the size of the reservoir include render cells HIV resistant, and hence the immune response, or flush out the reservoir and remove the infected cells the so-called shock and kill strategy. Second, ARVs extend life expectancy but do not erase the differences in health inequity. For example, in Switzerland, HIV-positive individuals with a higher education reach the level of life expectancy of the general population, but not patients with lower, lower level of education. Third, ARVs do not induce smoking cessation, and tobacco use is a cause of mortality and morbidity even greater than HIV-related factors in patients on efficient ART. For example, a man who start ART at age 40 and quit smoking gained 5.7 more years compared with men who continue tobacco consumption. In 2016 at Croy, Gerald Friedland said, from the outset, the epidemic was diverse and involved populations that were vulnerable, that were marginalized, and somehow the virus had this unique and diabolic way of finding them. This is still true. Political and societal factors are hampering the response to the AIDS pandemic beyond antiretroviral efficacy and access such as entry restrictions in certain countries for HIV-positive persons, gender inequity, criminalization of some aspect of sex work, detention center for intravenous drug users, or same-sex relationship criminalization. To conclude, and this will be my take-home message, we have never been so close from a universal regimen. We do have arguments to challenge the continuous and lifelong use of oral conventional triple therapy, or penicillin. Newer drugs with new mechanisms of action and child-adapted formulations will meet the need for improved regimens. A menu of options may be beneficial to a patient-centered approach as for contraception. Academic-led research should be supported to provide long-term data to improve access to care and quality of life and to reduce social inequities. Beyond antiretrovirals, there are still many outstanding challenges to achieve a generation without fear of AIDS. And I would like to acknowledge the many colleagues and friends who contributed to this presentation, Beatrice Greenstein, Jean-François Delfrécy, Bernard Hirschel, Fabrice Bonnet, Marco Victoria, the HIV unit in my hospital in Geneva, Laurent Kaiser, Malek, and many others that I really would like to thank today. And merci pour votre attention.
Let's open. It's a celebration. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Arda. I'm a proud Turkish heterosexual man. Seven years ago on my 28th birthday, I learned that I was pos. Uh, being HIV positive in Eastern Europe and Central Asia country region is not easy. Uh, we are very conservative about sex and HIV is heavily stigmatized. But learning about you equals you has changed that for me. Uh, my girlfriend and I no longer have to worry about passing the virus on to her. I can't even consider the possibility of being a father someday without putting my baby's mother at risk. Yeah! yeah. So now that we know that undetectable equals untransmittable, we need even more, that, more to demand access to HIV treatment for everyone. We need access to regular viral load testing so that we can be confident that the virus is terribly su suppressed. Young men, young men like myself have sex. We need to know that we should get tested and go on treatment right away. This will not only improve our health, but it will ensure that we are protecting the people we love. So, treatment access for everyone. Celebrate sex! My name is Bruce. I'm a gay man from New York. When I was diagnosed in 2003, I was terrified I was going to pass on the virus to someone I love. I delayed treatment for seven years because I couldn't bear the thought of taking pills every morning that would remind me that I was infectious every morning. It wasn't until 2012, after I had finally started treatment and I was virally suppressed, that my doctor told me I could not transmit the virus to anyone else. At first, I was elated, but then I became outraged. Why aren't we being told this? Why isn't everyone living with HIV hearing about this? There are too many gatekeepers who don't trust us with the information. Too many clinicians and service providers believe that because we are living with HIV, we can't be responsible. They decide who can and cannot be trusted, often filtered through intersecting stigma and prejudice and bias. We need all of you to find ways, please, to tell your patients, the people with whom you work, and the whole world that you equals you. Follow the science, not stigma. Trust people living with HIV. My name is Jackie Waboy. I am a woman from Kenya. My husband is HIV negative. And we are the parents of four beautiful children. I found out I was HIV positive in the year 2004. I started on treatment two years later. In 2008, I became pregnant with my youngest child. Nine months later, I gave birth to a wonderful HIV negative son, Marcus. Even before the research was available, I was confident that by staying adherent to my treatment, I would not pass the virus on to my husband or child. We who are living with HIV are not stupid. Most of us are parents raising our families. We have to be resourceful. We should not be treated like walking time bombs. We need to be empowered to manage HIV just like we manage all of the other challenging circumstances in our complex lives. Give us the facts. We demand access to continuing and routine viral load testing. This helps women living in rural areas as well. We demand that you help us spread the message that people who are undetectable cannot transmit the virus. This will help to end stigma we face every day. This will make more women and men willing to be tested and seek treatment. This will help us end the AIDS epidemic. Give people living with HIV the power. Let us live life.
to introduce our final speaker, please welcome back Madame la Présidente Valérie Percresse. Thank you. I would like to thank the uh, UNU initiative for reminding us that uh, the fight against AIDS is not only about prevention, but also uh, about the fight on serophobia and uh, also on ignorance. Thank you. As I told you, I want to make Paris region a leader in the fight against AIDS, and you're strengthening my conviction that we all have to work hand in hand, researchers, associative stakeholders, and political institutions. Thanks to Alexandra Calmy, we already learned today that we have to fix ourselves new goals, not the three 90s, but the five 90s, concentrating also on the acceptance of treatment and also on their cost. And that's a very interesting um, well, um, interesting lesson. Together, I think we share experience, we share best practices, and that's what these roundtables are all about. Now let me introduce Mr. Fabien Zulim. Mr. Zulim, you obtained your medical degree in gastroenterology and hepatology from the Lyon, pardon, <laughs> the Lyon Medical School in 1991. You also hold a PhD in molecular and cellular biology, and you were a postdoctoral researcher at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. As a professor of medicine, you have been teaching at Lyon 1 University since 1997, and you're currently the medical director of the hepatology department at the Hospice Civil of Lyon and the scientific director of the Department of Immunology and Virology at the Cancer Research Institute of Lyon-Cerm, where you lead the team on antiviral therapy for viral hepatitis. Hepatitis, sorry. You also served as an associate editor for the Journal of Hepatology, and you're currently the associate editor for GUT. You served as an expert in the macrobiology study section at INSERM, and you're the head of the clinical viral hepatitis study at ANRS. In 2004, you received the William Prusoff Award for the International Society for Antiviral Research in recognition of your work in the field of hepatitis B, molecular biology, and anti-HPV therapy. You have been the scientific coordinator of the European Community-Founded Network of Excellence which focuses on the management of antiviral drug resistance, and you're currently the head of the HPV cure program at ANRS. Mr. Zulim, you're a recognized expert in the field of viral hepatitis and antiviral therapy, and I'm very honored that you are here today with us, and I will tell everybody that I'm very delighted and proud today to see you all in Paris and in its region and uh, to make us the capital city for HIV and AIDS research in 2017. I wish you an excellent meeting and a nice stay in our beautiful region. Thank you. So, Madame la Présidente, thank you for the uh, uh, very nice introduction. And I would like to, to thank um, uh, the organizing committee and especially Jean-François Delfrécy for the invitation. This is really a, a, an honor uh, for me to, to give this presentation on the uh, challenges uh, towards the cure of hepatitis B virus infection. Uh, as you all know, chronic hepatitis B remains a, a major uh, public health problem. Uh, because uh, despite the availability of an efficient vaccine, uh, this is the uh, most prevalent uh, chronic viral infection worldwide with more than 200 million chronic carriers, and out of them only 2 million are, are, are treated. So this is much different from the HIV uh, situation. 
Uh, and uh, chronic HBV infection is the leading cause of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, which is also the second cause of cancer deaths worldwide. So there is a, a clear need for, for research to, to eliminate HBV infection and HBV-related diseases. And, and here we have two main uh, strategies that may rely on uh, a more uh, efficient vaccine coverage uh, worldwide and an, an improvement in the uh, antiviral treatment strategies. So as of today, uh, we have um, um, very uh, efficient drugs, um, which are mainly nucleoside analogs to treat uh, chronic HBV infections. But these drugs uh, induce viral suppression. So viral suppression can be uh, achieved in, in the majority of patients, whatever uh, the stage of, uh, of the liver disease. And this was shown to be associated to um, a decreased inflammation and liver fibrosis in the liver and to a decreased incidence of liver cancer. But this risk is not fully eliminated and this is a major challenge here. Um, the other point that is very important is that um, a viral suppression induced by nukes is uh, associated with an HBS antigen loss um, that is at maximum 10% after five years of therapy. And this explains why most of these patients need lifelong therapy. So what we would like to do now in this field is to go beyond viral suppression to, to achieve a cure of the infection. And for this, we will need novel molecular entities uh, that will be able to achieve the, um, a, a cure of the infection with this, um, a finite duration treatment uh, that will be based either on direct antiviral agents or immunomoderatory strategies or their combination. Um, with the hope that with a, a short-term treatment, we will be able to treat more patients and will have uh, more efficiency in the prevention of liver cancer. So to achieve this, we had to, to, to work on which endpoint we would like to, to achieve to guide clinical trials. So there was a, a major um, international workshop that we organized with ESL and ASLD, the European and the American uh, Liver Societies, uh, last fall in Washington, D.C., uh, with the regulatory agencies to define these endpoints. So we like to go beyond viral suppression that is already achieved by, by nucleoside analogs. And we uh, came to an agreement uh, to define several levels of, uh, of a cure of infection after treatment cessation. So the, the first level is a partial cure where HBS antigen level will be lower uh, and will be maintained low after treatment cessation. Um, the uh, next level is a functional cure where we would uh, obtain an HBS antigen loss uh, which will be, uh, would be associated with the persistence of the viral mini-chromosome, the so-called CCC DNA, in the liver of, of the patients, as well as integrated viral sequences. Uh, the next level uh, uh, of cure would be a complete cure where HBS antigen uh, loss would be associated with the uh, disappearance of CCC DNA, but the persistence of integrated viral DNA. In, in that situation, there would be no risk of reactivation from CCC DNA. And the uh, uh, holy grail and most optimistic uh, uh, definition would be a sterilizing cure where uh, not only HBS uh, antigen would, would be lost, but also all the intrahepatic uh, uh, vowel form um, uh, in, in that situation. But this is really uh, something very optimistic. And uh, today, the most realistic uh, endpoint for, to guide clinical trial is to achieve a functional cure of the infection. So to, to achieve the cure uh, of infection, uh, we will have to, to, to develop new antivirals and immunotherapeutic approaches, um, and we will need to, to have uh, different pathways that will be complementary, and this will go from drug discovery to uh, the identification of biomarker to, to accompany uh, uh, clinical uh, trials, uh, and obviously uh, access to care will have to be improved, especially uh, in uh, countries where uh, HBV infection is highly endemic, such as uh, Southeastern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and part of Latin America. 
So now to, to, to achieve this, we needed to have a better knowledge of the mechanism of our persistence. And, and we gained a, a lot of information in the past 10 years. Um, and there are mainly two different types of mechanisms, the virus-specific ones and the immune parts. Uh, regarding the virus-specific uh, mechanism, uh, the main one is the persistence of this covalently closed circular DNA, CCC, DNA viral mini chromosome within infected cells, this, which is responsible for the chronicity of the infection uh, and which leads to the production of viral proteins and, and viral antigens that lead to liver tolerance and HBV persistence. In chronically infected patients, we, we know that uh, most of these patients have defective immune responses. Uh, and these uh, defective immune responses um, are based on inefficient innate responses, defective B cell response, and defective CD8 positive uh, uh, cells. So we, we, we learn a lot on, on these different aspects, uh, and we are now in a position where we could identify new targets uh, to, to uh, try to uh, combat the virus. And you see here uh, uh, the, uh, a picture of the uh, uh, pathobiology of, of chronic HBV infection, just to show you that this is not um, only a simple thing with uh, an infection of an hepatocyte, but it, this has to take into account all the uh, liver microenvironment. And thanks to this uh, research effort that I just described you, we have now uh, identified uh, novel uh, uh, viral targets that include uh, viral entry, uh, the viral mini chromosome, uh, the polymerase, obviously, uh, capsid assembly, the uh, targeting of the uh, viral RNA and, and export of the virus. Uh, and besides the uh, uh, viral targets, there are uh, uh, immunotherapeutic approaches that are, that are being um, uh, developed, uh, either trying to boost the innate immunity or the uh, adaptive immunity, and I will go, come back to, to this in a few moments. Uh, you see here, this is a very complex disease, and there are major challenges if we want to achieve a cure of the infection. So I've tried to, to pick some of the, the challenges that we need to overcome to achieve a cure of infection. One of the uh, clinical challenges is the identification of, of novel biomarkers, because we need uh, uh, more efficient uh, uh, biomarkers to predict the cure of infection during clinical trials, and also biomarkers to ascertain the mode of action uh, of novel drugs. When you, you look at the uh, definition of the, uh, of the cure of infection uh, to, to guide clinical trials, what will be uh, required is to, to get biomarkers that would allow an early prediction of cure of, of the infection to assist a rapid clinical development of, uh, of novel drugs so that we, we can have a go or no-go no decision uh, rapidly before uh, um, achieving uh, the endpoint, the hard endpoint like functional cure that may take uh, quite a, a while. When we go back to the pathobiology of, uh, of HBV, uh, we, we have uh, actually uh, biomarkers that are uh, non-invasive, that, that are in, in the blood circulation, and those who are in the liver that need liver biopsy. So the classic uh, biomarkers that we are currently using uh, in clinical practice are the viral load assay measuring uh, the viral particles in serum and the quantitative HBS antigen assays. Uh, but these assays um, showed um, uh, to be very, uh, very efficient in predicting the clinical outcome, but are, have shown strong limitation in predicting the functional cure of infection. So we need to, to have novel biomarkers, and there are some emerging ones, which are the circulating viral RNA and the correlated uh, antigens. Obviously, in the uh, initial phase of clinical development, especially proof of concept, we need to know whether the novel drugs will have an effect on the viral mini chromosome, the key uh, component of viral persistence, the CCC DNA. And there are a major efforts to standardize uh, uh, technologies to, to study CCC DNA, and the first one was actually launched by the ANRS in France, and which was followed by, by Germany and now an international uh, uh, working group. 
So we just give you a couple of examples with drugs that we are using now, so nucleoside analogs that block vowel uh, reverse transcription, uh, block the uh, vowel load, so decrease vowel load in serum uh, of our patients, but they have no effect, on, for instance, on circulating vowel RNA. Um, and when you look at the novel uh, uh, drugs, uh, family of drugs, the capsid assembly modulators, uh, due to their mode of action, they uh, prevent uh, 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 vowel DNA release from infected cells, so a decrease in vowel load, but also a decrease in circulating vowel RNA and in correlated uh, antigen in serum. Uh, but they would have no effect on HBS antigen. So, but if we came with re really new drugs targeting CCC DNA, we would affect most of these markers. So here, with the development of novel biomarkers, we would be in a situation where we could differentiate the mode of action of the, of the novel drug and assess their uh, uh, clinical efficacy. The second challenge um, which we had to face was to have uh, study models for drug discovery. Um, and we, we had really major uh, uh, breakthroughs in the past five years. Uh, the first one was the identification of the cellular receptor for vowel entry, the sodium torocolate co-transported peptide, NTCP. Uh, a better knowledge of uh, CCC DNA biology and the HBX protein, the vowel uh, protein. And this knowledge uh, allowed to, to improve cell culture uh, uh, systems for target identification and, uh, and drug screening, uh, as well as the improvement of animal models such as the liver humanized mouse model. And this really was a, a breakthrough in the field because this allowed to characterize novel targets, and now we come with novel drugs that are in, in clinical development. The, uh, one of the important challenges will, will be to target CCC DNA, and there's a lot of discussion whether we'll be able to degrade it or if we have just to silence this vowel mini chromosome. I want to show you what one study here, which is a, a translational study that we've performed with our collaborators in Paris, uh, looking at a cohort of HIV, HBV co-infected patients treated for a long time with tenofovir, uh, and we had the chance to, 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 look, to have uh, not only serum uh, uh, samples available, but also liver biopsies in these patients. So all these patients were in so-called vowel suppressions for HBV uh, under tenofovir therapy. But when you look at the HBS antigen kinetics, you see that they were plateauing despite years uh, of therapy. So we this really showing you that we are, we were, are very far from achieving uh, a functional cure of HBV infection. We could look at the um, intrahepatic marker, and when you look at the uh, 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 open circle here, which shows the quantitative CCC DNA levels in the liver, we, we could show a, a, a decline of CCC DNA, but which was not more than one log after uh, uh, several years of treatment. Um, and this confirmed our previous uh, studies in, with, with adefovir. Uh, and uh, what we showed, which was kind of a surprise to us, is that when we look at the intrahepatic, total intrahepatic vowel DNA synthesis, uh, we showed that vowel DNA synthesis continued to, to, to occur despite tenofovir treatment, indicating that vowel suppression was not completely uh, inhibited in the liver and indicating that new round of infection or replenishment of the CCC DNA pool occurred uh, despite vowel, the so-called vowel suppression and explaining why uh, long-term therapy uh, is necessary because the CCC DNA pool is maintained. So now what are the uh, strategies if we want to target CCC DNA? The, the first approach would be to uh, uh, inhibit CCC DNA replenishment by inhibiting uh, vowel entry or, or being more potent in vowel suppression so that we could uh, inhibit the recycling of CCC DNA within infected cells. The second approach would be inhibiting the CCC DNA formation in the newly infected cells but we have to face uh, a, a cells that are chronically infected and we like to, to uh, achieve a CCC DNA degradation, which would be the holy grail. 
Uh, other strategies are, are being uh, also developed to uh, silence the viral mini chromosome uh, so that the, we, we would have um, an effect on, H, on, on the uh, HBS antigen levels. Uh, other strategies are, have been uh, also highlighted in uh, experimental models where it was shown that hepatocyte division is associated with CCC DNA loss, but this is an approach that uh, clinically we don't want to promote because uh, uh, hepatocyte division in, an, uh, uh, in a context of an oncogenic virus is, is not something that is uh, uh, um, uh, advisable because we, there would be a risk to select for uh, uh, cellular clones that may lead to liver cancer. Two years ago, there was a, a, a major breakthrough uh, from the group of Ula Prozor in Munich who, who showed a model for CCC DNA degradation. And in their um, cell culture uh, model, they showed that interferon alpha and lymphotoxin beta can uh, induce uh, CCC DNA degradation via an, an APOBEX3A or APOBEX3B uh, 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 mechanism. Now we have to see why uh, this occurred efficiently in, in cell culture experiment, but not in, in patients that are treated with interferon. So a lot of work is still needed in that area. So to summarize the challenges in targeting CCC DNA, there are uh, uh, strategies to inhibit formation of CCC DNA, but further knowledge would be required re regarding the host DNA repair factors involved in that formation. Regarding the uh, epigenetic control of CCC DNA, we need to, to uh, develop uh, virus-specific mechanism and mainly drugs targeting the HBX protein. And if we want to obtain a degradation of CCC DNA, we, like, we will have to work on immune-mediated degradation and, uh, as well as genome editing uh, approaches, which show a lot of promise uh, currently. Um, and we'll have to see in, in the near future uh, how we can deal with all these issues. Now there are uh, new classes of drug uh, that are coming along in, in clinical development. Uh, the first one is the capsid assembly modulators. Um, these drugs inhibit viral replication by interfering with nucleocapsid assembly and interfering with the CCC DNA recycling within infected cells. But they may have also uh, um, added um, uh, mode of action by interfering with the function of the core protein in infected cells, which may lead to restoration of host innate immunity and CCC DNA silencing. But for these two uh, mode of action, we still need to have confirmation from experimental models. Different classes of, of capsid assembly modulators are, are being developed. There are uh, hetero pyrimidine derivatives and phenylpropenamide derivatives. Um, and um, there's a lot of drugs, uh, as you can see here, uh, that are being evaluated in experimental models as well as uh, in clinical trials. Now they are entering phase 1b or even phase 2a uh, uh, studies. And just for sake of time, I will just show you one example, which was the first one to enter clinical evaluation. It was a, a capsid assembly modulator from Novira. Uh, and as you see here in, in the phase 1b study that uh, this uh, drug uh, could induce, after four weeks of therapy, uh, almost two log decline of HBV DNA in monotherapy. Um, it was also uh, able, to, uh, able to achieve a decrease in circulating viral RNAs, the viral markers that I told you about uh, a few minutes ago. And now there are a lot of trials with this drug and, and all competitors, actually, uh, to combine these uh, drugs with nucleoside analogs or interferon, or a triple combination, uh, and we'll, we'll see results in, a, in the next few months uh, in the next Congress. There are also uh, strategies to target HBS antigen. Uh, why targeting HBS antigen? Because HBS clearance is an endpoint of therapy, and because it was discussed for a long time that decline in HBS antigen level may restore the antiviral activity of exhausted T cells so that we could get an immune control of the infection as well. So there are several strategies in evaluation, RNA interference, nucleic acid polymers, HBS antibodies, and I will just show you one example with, with the uh, siRNA approach. And you see here that uh, an example of a, a siRNA tri clinical trial, here a phase two study, 
where patients were uh, uh, um, under vowel suppression with antecavir and received a single dose uh, of this SI RNA. Uh, and you see here in this HBE positive patients a very uh, sharp decline of HBS antigen after just one dose, um, which was never seen before uh, with whatever uh, drug we had. Um, but what is uh, intriguing was that in the E antigen negative patients, uh, the uh, uh, HBS antigen um, level were plateauing. And um, this was shown also to be confirmed in, the, uh, in chimpanzee, uh, and the, um, the company had to, to go back and study what was the mechanism for that, and they showed that actually uh, the SI RNA efficacy was impaired by integration, so they had to redesign their SI RNA to, to, um, to have target sequences upstream of the integration site. So there are also other con uh, considerations that are being uh, addressed with SI RNA, but the main one will be to know whether the uh, um, suppression of HBS antigen level will result in restoration of immune responses, or whether we will need to to combine with uh, uh, new therapeutic approach, uh, immunotherapeutic approaches. And for that, uh, we'll need to know better the mechanism of T-cell exhaustion and see whether this may lead to eradication or just a control of the infection. So there were major findings in the past five years uh, in the uh, immunopathology of the, uh, of the infection. Uh, the group of Antonio Bertoletti in Singapore showed, uh, uh, really, showed really interesting data that challenged the, the concept of immune tolerance. They showed that in the so-called immune tolerant patients um, that uh, uh, um, T cell functions were preserved. So this is opening completely new avenues uh, for the management of, uh, of these patients on the clinical point of view, but also for, for clinical trials. Uh, our group has also shown that in chronically infected patients, innate immunity genes are, are repressed in the liver of, of patients, which may lead to, to uh, novel immunotherapeutic approaches. A very recent study uh, published in Nature Medicine by, by uh, Carlo Ferrari uh, showed the mechanism uh, of exhaustion uh, in the HBV-specific CD8 T cells, and they showed that these exhausted cells uh, have mitochondrial dysfunction, and this uh, actually um, is something reminiscent to what Professor Angel uh, said uh, uh, earlier on for, for cancer. So what do we want to do in terms of restoration of antiviral immunity? There are strategies to boost innate immunity, uh, to, pro to produce intrahepatic uh, cytokine, or to, to improve intrahepatic cytokine delivery. There are uh, strategies to boost the adaptive immunity uh, by blocking inhibitory signals or inducing T cells with uh, therapeutic vaccine or even engineering uh, T cells. So I will just show you a couple of examples that uh, uh, from clinical uh, experience. So the first one is on uh, boosting the innate immunity. It's a, uh, a clinical trial with a TLR7 agonist in patients who were in valve suppression induced by, by nucleoside analogs and uh, received this TLR7 agonist. And they, they showed in that study uh, that the level of induction of ISG15, the interferon stimulated gene 15, was much better in patients who had a lower HBS antigen level, which also would be an argument to, to lower the HBS load. Uh, unfortunately, despite very promising results in chimpanzees and, and, and woodchuck model, in clinical trials, the, this TLR7 agonist uh, administration didn't lead to improved antiviral e efficacy. So we'll have to see how we should combine this TLR7 agonist with other strategies in the future. Um, PD-1 blockade, so you, you heard about it uh, uh, earlier on, and there was a very nice study from the group of uh, Carlo Ferrari, again, uh, looking ex vivo at the uh, restoration of T-cell function uh, t with T-cells coming either from the liver or, or from the blood of the infected patient, and it showed that with uh, PD-1 inhibitors, you, you can really restore T-cell function. And there was 
so uh, uh, leading to, to, to that direction, a combination trial that was just presented a few weeks ago uh, at the ESL meeting in Amsterdam, um, where uh, patients who were in vowel suppression with, with nucleoside analog uh, receive either nivolumab, a single dose, very low dose, to, to be very cautious to avoid side effects, uh, either alone or in combination uh, in blue with a therapeutic vaccine. And you see that in, in this phase one study, it's really a phase one, a few patients, um, one patient uh, uh, could clear the, the infection, obtain a, a functional cure. And you see that in the combination uh, uh, arm, there was a, a, a trend for uh, uh, a better decline of HBS antigen levels, but we, we have to now work on the dose of, uh, of nivolumab and the number of administration and see whether we can improve these results. So here is a summary of the landscape, uh, all the different drugs that are in clinical development. Uh, and I think we are in a very exciting moment. And uh, we, we, all these drugs show uh, a lot of promise, uh, but we are at the crossroad. We don't know w which combination will be the best um, and how it, we, 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 it will work. Uh, so uh, we have to see with, our, with uh, much better uh, antiviral treatments, uh, the, we will be able to restore the intrinsic uh, 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 antiviral immunity or whether we will have to combine antivirals and uh, um, uh, immunotherapeutic approaches to achieve a functional cure in, in more patients. Um, having said that, I think knowing the field uh, and, and knowing all the efforts that are being made uh, worldwide on the academic side, industrial side, and the involvement of stakeholders, I think HBVQ will be an attainable goal within the next decade. And uh, thanks to international HBVQ program, and uh, I have to, to mention here that ANRS was a pioneer here because we started in France four years ago this program, and this was followed by many others in Germany and now in the international coalition uh, to, to eliminate HBV, the ICE-HBV uh, coalition, uh, I believe that we will be able to, to um, achieve this goal uh, in a reasonable uh, amount of time. And I would like to, to conclude by uh, acknowledging my collaborators at the uh, liver unit and in the research lab, especially uh, Massimo Levrero, David Durantel, Barbara Testoni, and Julie Lucifora, who contributed a lot in, the, in, in their work and in, in the uh, uh, data that I presented today. And I would like to, to thank for your, your attention and also all the sponsors, including ANRS uh, and others in France. Thank you. The conference organizers would like to thank all the speakers and co-chairs for their participation. The plenary session is now over.